Okay. I'll give you your fucking, your, your sink point right there. That's it. <laughs> I'm Sean Reiner. I play drums for uh, many bands, obviously for death and during the human era, and for a band called Cynic. You're watching Drum Talk. Inspiration for me starting to play drums was just my connection to music. When I was four, I went, my parents took me to go see Tchaikovsky's uh, Dying Swan, the ballet. And instead of sitting in the seat and watching, I walked up, moved the curtain, and sat with my feet hanging over the orchestra pit and just watched the whole time all the musicians playing. And then after that, I told my mom I wanted to play French horn. <laughs> French horn. <laughs> she didn't buy me a French horn, thank God. <laughs> but, uh, and then I was always begging for a piano. My grandmother bought us a piano, predicated on the fact that both me and my sister take lessons. My sister took one lesson, hated it. I loved it. Uh, this is when I was seven. So I started playing piano. Um, and I had lessons for three years. And I was always into rock and roll. Um, you know, my first record when I was five was Kiss Hotter Than Hell. And I would walk around with my little tape player playing this and bought all their records. I don't know, at some point drums just really made sense to me. I already had, you know, the, the finger dexterity and independence. And so when MTV came out in 1980, you could see guys playing music. It made perfect sense to me. And I was like, I want to play drums. And I remember my piano teacher at that time, um, he would just play and I, he had a pair of drumsticks and I would just sit there on a pillow and play to him. And he would shift into different things and I would pick up on it and he goes, he told my mom, he goes, you know, he's, he's very rhythmically inclined, you know. And so uh, I begged my mom and at 10 years old, she bought me a snare drum. She said, in six months, if you practice that, and you know, do what your teacher says, and your teacher agrees, we'll get you a drum kit. And I drove the, her crazy, <laughs> snare drum everything. So, and then, yeah, when I was 10 and a half, I got my first drum kit. And then my biggest influences were kind of like Neil Peart, you know, Stuart Copeland. And when I saw it and heard it, everything made sense to me. And so I, I, I just, it just easily, along with having a good teacher, kind of, you know, grew and grew. And then I kind of, you know, uh, as any musician does, the more you play, you get into more technique. And then being a teenager, you get into more angst. So, you know, and this is when now Metallica's and Slayer's and all these things are happening. And so it was about playing fast. And then it was, oh my God, double bass, what's that? So I got my first double bass kit when I was like 14. Pearl Export, I remember, the fiber kits, wasn't even real wood. And even the guy at the drum shop was just like, you know, wow, you know what I mean? For 14, keep going, you know what I mean? Like I always, I always had encouragement and always, you know, uh, my mom always said she never had to tell me to practice. They had to tell me to stop, you know what I mean? Like stop. I think by the time blast beats really became like part of the metal language, I was already kind of done digesting that stuff. Because when I recorded the death record, I wasn't listening to metal. I was listening to Chick Corea and all these fusion records that, you know, I always had one foot in and one foot out because my teachers were always like, you know, check out the legitimate music, you know, versus the heavy stuff. I always saw what was required technique wise and you know what I mean? Like everything requires practice, but the blast beat never appealed to me. I don't know. There was a band back in the early eighties called Wehrmacht and they were from Portland or Seattle. And they were one of the first bands to just like full on and really fast, but they, they were kind of like Frank Zappa. Like their lyrics were really quirky and their songs were kind of jokes, but I don't know, just for me, I had already, 
how fast can you play? I was already burnt out on like that fact. Like it shouldn't be about how fast you can play. Like I think by by the time you know I was recording records, it was more about playing what's right for the music, for our music, what you know, whatever that was. And I I, I never came across something that demanded that. You know what I mean? So I never gave it the time, and it was never a passion of mine. I, like I said, I always straddled the line. So it was like to have a certain amount of skill on double bass and playing fast was good enough for me because I still wanted to incorporate the grooves and the ghost notes and the dynamics of the other styles of music I was playing. And to me, you had metal at that time, it didn't offer me dynamics. It was like on or off, you know, just you know, one level of playing. And it got to a certain point where we started pulling back from the metal elements, you know what I mean, to mix the other styles in. It was, it was you know, more, more of the projects I was involved with than, you know, like this conscious decision not to do it. But, uh, you know, to me, it was just never a passion. It was always something to me I could just admire to, and other drummers, you know what I mean? Like, wow, you know. I mean, to, it, like the same thing with the fastest drummer in the world competitions. It's like, that's super cool, but, um, but I mean, you know what I mean? I mean, if that's uh, the important thing as to how many strokes you can get, I mean, I could, my mind goes, that's amazing, but my ear goes, what does that do? You know what I mean? Not to take away from it, but it's just, to me, it just didn't resonate with something I wanted to really pursue. But I played a blast beat tonight. <laughs> no, but it was the Chuck blast beat. It was the it was the 1987 blast beat. <laughs> so uh, yeah. Anyway. I just I always hated not only a hi hat that was like this high, but over here. Like, what, what is this? You know what I mean? So to have my hi-hat where I could almost get my grim shot without having to negotiate this hand. I mean, whether you have it on the inside or the outside, you can still put both pedals together and play them together. But I, when I did that, it, it, for some reason, it lent myself to playing both at the same time. And for some weird reason, when I play double bass, my left foot is my downbeats. So I have eighth notes on the hi-hat at the same time versus the off. It's if you're playing triplets. And I just thought, what a cool thing, you know what I mean? To be able to play both at once. But I started with, you know, on the Death Human record, I think it was... 10, 12, 13, 14, 16, 18. And the older I get, the more it's just reduce, reduce, reduce. I guess just getting more out of less, you know. There was always a way to get those sounds without having to have too much stuff, you know what I mean? And I think economy of motion is a big part of how I play, you know, like not having to really stretch too much for things and having everything just kind of look at me in a nice friendly way and so I can close my eyes and still play because I can visualize my, my things and I guess there's a visual, right? And I, I, but I, you know, I think Cynic and my, our, my philosophy just even playing wise has never been about the showmanship necessarily, more so about the integrity of the playing or the, and the selfishness in a way of being selfish about your music. And it's like, this is how I play. Like, even when I toured with Death the first time, it was like, my hair was in a braid. It wasn't down and I wasn't head banging. It was like, no, I got a lot of stuff to play, man. I don't, I don't need, I can't worry about like looking good or, you know what I mean? Like, I got a job to do here, you know? And like, no, which is not to say the drummers that fucking, you know, stick tricks and do their show, like that's amazing to me. Um, but I just, it's not, it's not something I would invest I personally, you know what I mean? Like, think be, different. Think different than be that, uh, that one year old drummer yeah. who doesn't know what to do. Yeah. That's kind of interesting. Yeah, I did that back in the 
in the human era, actually, even in the studio. And Gary Husband did that a lot. He had just toms and no, just random order and just, you know, tom combinations. And yeah, no, it makes you think differently for sure. Because you don't have high to low or low to high. It's, it's you know, yeah, it's, uh, well, I would invite anybody to check out the Gary Chester book, New Breed, because that will expose a lot of that on page one. The yeah. most simple thing in the world will, you'll just be like, I can't believe I can't do that. Yeah, and I never made it past page one. I'm, I'm just what I'm saying. No <laughs> that was, whoo, okay. Yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah. I mean, maybe early on, certainly focus, I can understand that. There's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of ideas, a lot of parts. But again, I think, you know, as we mature as musicians, it gets to the point where you extract as much from one idea as you can. But yeah, no, we're selfish with our music and you know, it's a good thing because you have to play that music every night, <laughs> you know what I mean? So you might as well make it something that, you know, at least truly came from you, do you know what I mean? Uh, I mean, know a lot of bands that are just like, so sick of this, well, it's, that's what you put out, you know what I mean? Like. Be prepared to play that because, you know, that's going to be your legacy. And Greg Bissonette just told me that. He goes, like, my new thing is, like, I just want to make people dance. Like, seriously, make them move. Like, if I'm getting their head to shake, then I'm doing my job. And I was just like, that's, that's I guess that's interesting. I mean, it's true, right? You know, there's... Um, I mean, of course, we're playing to crowds that really know the music, so no matter what, they're, they're moving. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess if, you're, when, if you play to an audience that's just sitting there, you're, oh, it sucks the life out of you, you know what I mean? Like, oh, you want, you know, you want people to get into it. So, I mean, it makes sense. And drums are time. We're timekeepers, right? We are the, the beat keepers, so it makes sense. You know, you want... You want that? Yeah, 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 yeah. The other side. Oh. <laughs> uh, I mean, no. I, I'm, I'm just. I react to the music we're writing. I can hear what needs to happen, or what can happen, and we've kind of been in a situation for a long time where we don't have an in-house bass player that I dictate the bass lines. I can hear them when I approach a guitar riff. I know exactly what that bass line is gonna be like when I write my drum part. You know, I mean, there's a top and a bottom and a middle, you know. The bottom's the kick drum, snare drum's the backbeat, that's kind of the meat. And then you have what's on top. To me, sometimes the kick and the snare can designate what the groove is, but then sometimes a cymbal pattern or a hi-hat constant quarter note or eighth note gives you the reference. So, you know, I kind of come from the Gary Chester new breed school of, of playing. So I approach, you know, the four limb thing. It's like, what's my kick and my snare drum doing? And then what's my ride cymbal pattern? Is my hi-hat on the beat, off the beat, not playing? It's just, it's, it's really, I don't know how to explain it. It's very obvious to me what needs to happen when I hear music or, or a groove or something. I'm very form oriented. I, sections I, make sense to me. I can see a whole song really quickly and know what all the parts are. And so, I mean, I do try to have my parts evolve because maybe you get something the second time or the third time, or maybe something's subtracted the second time or the third time, or, you know, always having some sort of evolution or de-evolution to the drum part, I think is kind of where I come from. Instead of just playing the same thing, the same thing, and then that part's the same thing. And, you know, and again, serving the music. It's not trying to fit like the craziest shit into one thing. It's like, what does this call for? What is this really calling for? And sometimes it's something really super basic. You know, like, they get the basic skeleton there, and then you, you know, look at it and say, okay, well, in this part, you're doing that, and this, you return this, so maybe I'll 
quote that this time before it's there. So even subliminally, you don't even realize I'm playing a part that's going to end up happening later in the tune or, you know, vice versa. Because I had to do a lot of transcribing, a lot of listening, a lot of ear training, a lot of dictation. So you kind of learn to hear these motifs and these things that repeat and evolve and, you know. I like them both. And for different reasons. No click, you have an organic piece of music that you can push and pull and stretch. And I tend to like that music more than not. But when I actually have to play to a click, it's kind of refreshing because you know where it's going to be at all points. For instance, you're in the studio and you're playing to a click. I can do four versions of the tune, top to bottom, and then go back and listen to the four tracks I played. And you'd be amazed that you hear a difference in every single time. And you can pick the, the best bits of that and then compile that. But then you have no click in the organic nature. And this last Cynic record was no clicks. It was, you, we would start out with a click. I had my phone. Okay, we're done. And then just up to a certain section and then it's free. And then we'd play. Okay, done. Listen, listen back. Okay, that's great. Now we're starting from this place. New click, but only for reference, like a couple bars and then go. And I love the recording. It's got this elasticity to it. You know what I mean? There's something to be said about finishing a tune a little bit faster, a little more aggressive or not. A little bit slower, like it's slowed down. And some of my favorite records are completely clickless. I mean, my God, anything in the 70s is just, really, you know. And there's something about capturing that performance and knowing that's it. Putting it all into that moment versus, oh, okay, I have the ability to go back and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so there's, you know, like I said, I'd almost love it live in a way because you know you're gonna, your tempos are going to be exactly the same. You know, you're not going to be playing too fast or too slow because here it is. But at the same time, if you mess up, <laughs> then phew, how do you get back on the train? You know what I mean? No, for me, playing certainly playing the early stuff, it's I want to play it kind of as close to as I can. You know, I'm not going to go too crazy. I'm going to throw some fills in, but I'm not going to change grooves or tempos. And then the human stuff, it's, you know, I'm going to play what I try to play what I did when I was 20 years old, you know. <coughs> I had a little more energy back then. Um, There's a certain amount of conditioning needed, but it still was like, it was already in my bones. You know what I mean? It was already, it was kind of like revisiting an old friend. And he's like, you catch up, you know. And, you know, for a long time after Cynic broke up and I went back to school and, you know, wanted to do other styles of music, I kind of was like, I'm not a metal drummer. I'm, you know, like I just, I was trying to get rid of that. And I could never, because anywhere I would go, it would be like, Death Human, Death Human, this record followed me everywhere and you know I was just like fuck no I want to break away from this but I'm so honored to have people still respond to that record and I mean these shows have been sold out so I mean it's it, it's I'm humbled by it you know that people are still pleased to hear that music I mean I'm kind of, I'm coming back from the Achilles injury I have a torn meniscus you know it, it's, it hasn't been easy but the fact that people have such a positive response to it makes it extremely worthwhile, you know what I mean? And, uh, and I'm not trying to get rid of that shadow anymore. It's like I, I, I am embracing it because it's, you know, I'm lucky that people come up and know something I've done or get inspired. When anybody says, you know, that record made me rethink about it, that's just the most amazing thing, you know, that's the best compliment you can get. That's an, and that's an amazing thing, you know? Like, doesn't pay my bills, doesn't, you know what I mean? But, but for the heart, yeah, no, it's exactly, it's, it's, it's like, all right, high five, man, you know what I mean? Like, shit, that's not a bad thing, you know what I mean? Seriously, so. Well, I mean, goals are just, I mean, truly to still support myself playing music. 
doing things that are creative versus not. I've spent a lot of time working for record companies and working for management companies and, you know, to, right, answering phones, doing whatever to pay the bills. And I mean, to be able to support myself playing music and not have to work for anybody else, I think is, that's the supreme goal. I mean, of course, it's to write good music and put stuff out there that people respond to. And But again, thinking in the mode we've always thought, which is kind of just personally selfish, is to play music I like to play. And if I can survive off that, let go of the fact that I'm not going to have a mansion somewhere. With, that's okay to me, you know what I mean? As long as I'm happy with what I'm doing. And challenged, too, yeah. I mean, having new sides. And I think that's where I'm so happy that I you know, played piano and always was into theory and write. And so, I mean, the new goals are more of the film and TV stuff, which I've done a lot of, but that's, that's kind of where the main thinking is. It's like, I'll always have the drums and I'll always pursue that stuff, but I want to get more into the other instruments and the other textures and the other challenges of music, you know? And so, I mean, I maybe, a chess drummer in that way that I there is a plan to move more into that realm but uh, we still take the opportunities that come our way and if that's tours like this I would have never thought in a million years this would have happened but the stars kind of aligned in the right way and people's schedules and the timing happened and you know here 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 we are uh, just hopefully I'm smart enough to make good decisions and you know, hopefully I can repair my body and keep that train rolling. But I mean, if not, there's, there are other options. It'll still be music, uh, you know. I mean, I love to cook. And I think if, in another life I might have become a chef, but you know, I think that's a hobby at this point. <laughs> I don't think I'm gonna open up a restaurant. <laughs> I mean, I guess we have to see what the future holds. I mean, there's some things I'm working towards, but sometimes those things lead you in other places. and. You have decisions to make and crossroads to choose from. And it's the interesting thing about life, you know? And uh, certainly as a musician, it's, you know, you, Neil Peart wants to ride his motorcycle. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, you just, it, things happen for whatever reasons. And, you know, yeah. I mean, as long as there's passion there, and you know what I mean? Nice. Okay, thanks. Yeah, cheers, man. <laughs>